Today I'm going to be opening with the scripture again in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. Can we ask the Lord's blessing now? Father, I just thank you for this great day of visitation and the day when you're opening the eyes of our understanding. You're giving us the spirit of enlightenment that, Father, we might know what is the hope of the calling, the glory, the riches of the inheritance that's in us, and also the exceeding greatness of the power that raised Jesus from the dead that's also available to us. Father, let the hearts of our minds be open to receive all that you have for us in this day. I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Again, this verse has been a major uh, part of what we've been sharing for a few weeks now. It's very important for us to understand our former state, if you would. Now, this is important to understand. Uh, The clicker's not working. I was going to move forward. I don't know. Ah, there we go. Now it went too fast. Let me see. That uh, our past state. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about what it was like before you became a Christian. Now, this is important for us to understand because when you came to the Lord, it wasn't just about you accepting Jesus Christ and becoming a Christian. The Bible says it's important for us to understand that before we came to the Lord, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were separated from the life of God goes all the way back to the story of the beginning when mankind decided they would go their own way rather than go God's way. The Bible says that God told them that the they, they, they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. They didn't die physically, but they died in the sense that they were separated from God. But it's important to understand that it isn't just about being separated from God. The Bible says that there's also the God of this world, the spirit of the age, that now works in the sons of disobedience. So we've talked about the fact that the serpent in the garden, also called the devil and Satan and dragon, and the dragon in the book of the Revelation, is our enemy that seeks to enslave us. And people don't realize this, but outside of God, there's other spirits and influences that we can come under. And the Bible says that the enemy always tries to get us into ourself. So when you're following him, it's not like you're saying, well, I'm on the devil's side. It's more likely you're like, I'm on my side. You fulfill the lusts of your flesh, the desires of the flesh and desires of the mind, the Bible says. You live out your human nature apart from your spiritual nature. You're simply in bondage, and then God comes and he raises us from the dead. How many out there have been raised from the dead? Amen? So we had our former conduct, we have our former state, and now as Christians we have to understand, well, what does it mean to live as a Christian? So we know there was a spiritual thing that happens when we give our life to the Lord, we bury our old life, we rise to walk in newness of life, we believe in living the spirit-filled life so we can be motivated by God. But how many know there's a learning process where we're not just living in the old way, but we're learning about the new way? And that's what the Bible calls Christian maturity, as we live less from the natural perspective and more from the spiritual perspective The human spirit that God has put inside of us, which the Bible says is the candle of the Lord, so that we can walk in fellowship with him. Now, we've been talking about what that means. Today, I want to cover another area of it uh, as we go now to the scriptures uh, in Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so we understand the conflict that we face today, which is the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, was there from the very beginning of time, before mankind ever sinned and before they ever fell out of favor with God, before they were cut off from the tree of life, they still had temptation and they still had conflict they had to face. 
That's why I wrote the book, Why is the Devil in Your Garden? Because we need to know the adversary is there to tempt us, and we have to understand how to be an overcomer in this life. And actually, we can find out that as we resist the devil, he not only will flee from us, but how many know we can be stronger in the Lord? So what are his devices? What are his strategies when he comes to us? Well, first of all, if Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, how do we know she shouldn't have been standing by the tree? Come on, how do we know you're not going to be able to eat of the tree if you're not standing there? Because there weren't people that went through and picked the fruit and brought it to you. It was a deliberate choice she made to look at this and think about it. Now, the enemy wanted her to think about it. Now, as a pastor, oftentimes I like to get people to stop and think because sometimes people get caught up in their emotions and their feelings and they're not thinking. But we need to sometimes come to the place of our thinking and let our thought processes work. But how many know when we do that, we should also do it with the help of the Word of God and also the Spirit of God? Sometimes when we are thinking, it's a dangerous thing. Especially if the wrong person has given us the information. How many know what I'm talking about today? So if somebody wants you to think about something, but they're planning a thought in your head in the process, you need to be very careful. And that's literally what the devil was doing here. He comes to Eve, and first of all, he wants her to think, you know what, God is afraid you're going to be like him. You, you can't trust him. Now, let's think about this for a little while, recognizing what God's wanting to do and really inside what you're wanting to do. You need an independence day. God just wants to control you. He don't want you to be like him where you get to make your own choices. I want to put up their independence day because when we come into this world as babies, we're totally dependent on somebody else to take care of our needs and also our desires. We do the best we can to inform them, even as children, take care of me now, usually is our thinking as a child. But as we're ministered to by our parents, our parents are also at the same time understanding the responsibility to train you, to separate you from your self-centered motivation so you begin to realize how to get control of your feelings, how to get control of your body, how to mature and how to grow. And as a part of that governing process, they're telling you what time to go to bed, whether you need to take a nap, what time you're supposed to get up in the morning, telling you how to dress, how to clean. Uh, all kinds of things you're instructed in so you can learn how to go through life. So from an early age, after having all of that control, and now somebody telling you what to do, how many know you're growing up, you're thinking, I'm waiting for Independence Day? For some, it's just the idea that, well, you're going to be able to make your own choices, and that's why things like getting your license for the first time, I mean, you can't wait to get your license. Why? Wow, I'll be able to drive, and I'll be able to get to go where I want to go, maybe get a job so I can have my own money and do my own thing as a part of the thinking. Then you think about, oh, when I get to get out on my own, maybe go to college and go away to college so you can really be free and do your own thing. Or maybe you're just going to go out and get a career at an earlier stage in life and then again have your own money, make your own choices. How many know Independence Day is a motivator in our life? So the enemy knows that. Again, what does he do? He works in our natural instincts and situations. And so he's using those for his advantage. And so he comes to Eve and says, do you realize that you are under control? Now think about this. God created the Garden of Eden, put man in the garden. Eden means voluptuous, living, delightful land. God creates mankind, he gives him a dominion mandate. God had so many wonderful things. There's only one thing you can't do. Can't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the enemy comes in and says, hey, did God say you can't eat of any of these trees? Well, no, there's only one tree. Oh, well, let's think about that tree for a minute. What is that tree? It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course, that's when everything began to turn in the wrong direction as Eve was willing to entertain all of these thoughts. And now I want to put up this little thought because the enemy was offering her freedom. And that's a thought that most people have these days. I want to be free. I want to be fulfilled. I want to be able to do my own thing. And in the process of that, we should always ask the question, well, are you really free? Are people in the world, are they really free? 
It's important to understand that because in the world in which we live, everybody's looking for freedom. Everybody wants to do their own thing. I have to find my identity. I have to know who I am. And so in the process of all of this, we have to ask ourselves the question, well, are, are you really free? I know as a Christian, the Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Church, I want you to know something. I'm free in Jesus Christ. Amen? He has set me free, and I can walk in the freedom of what he has for me. And I look out there at the world, and I say, they're in bondage. They're being sold a bill of goods, and unfortunately, oftentimes, they're falling for those things. Which brings us to this next aspect, because how many know the devil has a sales pitch? Well, he's not the only one who does. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. What happened then? The eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. See, the enemy had this uh, bill of goods he's selling, and he takes him to the tree of knowledge, and he's like, you know, knowledge is independence. When you really know what's going on, when you really understand what's going on, that's when you're really free because then you can get control of the situation. Now, knowledge is a good thing. It's important for us to recognize that knowledge is a good thing, especially if it's the right knowledge. How many know the knowledge of the Lord is wonderful? The knowledge of the ways of God are good, but also a lot of Earthly knowledge, if you would, natural knowledge is very good. In human society, especially during the times of the Enlightenment, Renaissance periods of middle history, uh, people began to print books and people began to have education, and it became a wonderful experience for people to have knowledge. And now we have seen an increase of knowledge, just like the Bible says, and not only is knowledge increasing by a very fast pace, but the availability of that knowledge is everywhere around us. So we have all kinds of knowledge these days, and with that, multitudes of opinions that people have. But we have to be careful about knowledge, because knowledge doesn't always bring understanding. And this is an admonition the Bible says, be careful of knowledge, because knowledge puffs up. And sometimes you have just about enough knowledge to be dangerous. I know, for instance, when I shared with you how that when I was growing up at a very early age, literally, it, it sounds like a fantasy, but it's actually true. At 10 years old, I'm reading the newspaper, getting involved in the news and following politics. I loved history, so I studied history. And as a part of that, I loved the social science and everything to do with that. I had an interest in really about current events. So government, politics, current events, and the economy, these were things all a part of my quest for knowledge as I was growing up. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes when I talk to people about politics, I, they'll make a statement, and I think, well, they don't even know government, so they don't understand that that doesn't exactly work. Of course, I don't tell them all the time. <laughs> sometimes I do. Uh, then sometimes our political views are skewed because we don't have a sense of history because that has a lot to do with current events when you understand history. I love history, and I believe that if you don't learn history, it's going to repeat itself. And I can see a lot of repetition going on right now in the world in which we live today. Amen. Uh, unfortunately, actually, you can be elected to public office and go to Washington and not know government or history or economics. And anyway, that's another story altogether. But the, the point of that is, is we have to have knowledge, but we have to be careful about thinking that we're an expert in every area because the truth of the matter is we're very limited in our ability to be experts in certain areas. And so with that in mind, we have to constrain ourselves and understand the limitations of their opponents. Now, as well as I know those factors and thinking about politics, I would say that, well, I'm certainly not an expert in these things because there's another aspect of these things you have to be aware, aware of, and I put it up here, agendas and marketing. Now, I might know all these things about politics and I might have my ideas about these things, but where the things are decided, whether it's the national things in Washington or the state things in Lansing, whatever, how many understand that, well, in those places, it's not about your knowledge about what you know. How many know a lot of people have agendas? 
Now, oftentimes people talk about conspiracy theories, and I like to downplay that to a certain extent because it's important for people to understand, don't matter what conspiracies the enemy comes up with, God sits on the throne. Amen? Amen. And, uh, but yet it's very important for us to understand that in every group of people, there are what you would call the elites. They're the ones who think they really know what you need. And so whether it's politics or whether it's independence or, or ec entertainment or whether it's what's going on in New York in the economic circles, there's a whole lot of people who think, well, when we say knowledge puffs up, they think, well, the common man has no idea what's really going on. And so oftentimes because of their agendas that are going on there, they try to manipulate the situations to their advantage. One example of this is abortion. Most Christians in America are anti-abortion, so we look for politicians that are the same, but oftentimes there are people who want to use this for their advantage, so they'll say they're anti-abortion, but then they get an office and you notice they don't do anything about it once they're there. Why? Because, well, they had an agenda, and because they had an agenda, they tried to figure out how to get us in their agenda. I mean, how many know that happens all the time? And I also put up here marketing because this is a very important concept to understand because we're being marketed every single day. When I was in college, I've shared this a few times at OCC. I took a class called the Psychology of Adjustment. And in it, they talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I never think psychology is true, so take this in the context that I'm sharing. But in this particular thing, I saw a lot of uh, understanding in it, if you would. Because in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they say that, first of all, people are most motivated by their need to get their basic needs, like food and water and shelter. Once that happens, they're more concerned about their security and safety needs, and then it moves up to a sense of love and belonging. From there, it goes to esteem values, and from there, it's called self-actualization. That's why we always have border issues. We, it's not a new process. We've had it many times before. Way back in the 80s, uh, they came up with a solution for immigration. It's always going to be a problem because as long as there's people who are in the bottom two levels of security uh, needs or basic needs, they're going to be trying to get to a country like ours because how many know most of us have all of our basic needs? Which brings us to where we are, and that is we have what they will call love and belonging needs. We have esteem needs and really the desire for self-actualization, which means self-fulfillment, basically. And that's where, if you look out at the world today, how many know that's what the cry of our society is? I got to be myself. I got to be able to do my thing. I, I was born this way, and so I have to find satisfaction. And so everything's about self-fulfillment feeling good about who you are, so they want to say, well, uh, I'm proud of who I am, and also, of course, a sense of belonging, which says, you have to accept me and also approve me. So that's the debate level that we're at today. But as it pertains to economics, last week I said, don't get bored by my history today, it's don't get bored by my economic conversation, <laughs> because this is important to understand. Because in America we have our basic needs that are met, most of the things we buy, most of the things we want and are willing to purchase really have to do with our esteem needs, have to do with our desire for self-fulfillment, and sometimes it's a sense of belonging. That's why in countries like the United States of America, 70% of our GDP is based upon consumption. Why? Well, if you're buying something, it's not likely that you have to have it it's much more likely you want it. And you may not want it because, well, it's just something you wanted. It might be something that you want because, well, people have been saying, well, you know, this is when you can really belong when you fit in a certain economic category or this is when you really have arrived in life when you have this and that. And so there's this always intense marketing going on in a country like ours to try to get us to buy something. And I always think it's, funny in fashion how things change and all of a sudden all of a sudden well what we used to like we don't like why because somebody has convinced us whether we realize it or not we want something new I remember in, in the 60s real skinny ties were in come to the 70s and all of a sudden they're getting wider and wider 
Throw away all your skinny ties, get the big wide ties. Then all of a sudden, they're getting skinny again. For some reason, you think you have to have the tie that's in style. Of course, now you just throw them all out, but uh, nobody wears them pretty much. And, and so what has happened is, well, somebody along the line decides, well, we've got to start selling ties. Everybody has all the big ones they need, so let's switch over to small. Bonnie and I like to watch the home improvement shows. And uh, in those, you know, they go into the house, and right now everybody says, oh, we've got to have an open floor plan. Okay, tear down these walls. Yeah, tear down all these walls. And basically, after a while, you notice most of the houses look alike and have the same basic elements involved because there's this desire to get people to buy things or to remodel so we buy. So after a while, everybody says, we got to have an open floor plan. Why? Well, because we didn't used to have an open floor plan. Now, I'm always the contrary person. I'm like, I don't want an open floor plan. Sometimes I want to get a room and nobody see me. Anyway, that's another story. So we, we are always being convinced we want something. And that's why if I, Bonnie and I watch those shows long enough, all of a sudden they're going to start saying, Oh, an open floor plan. Give me some walls. Why? Because there's marketing out there getting us to buy, getting us to consume. And, of course, going with that are all of these things that want to affect our behaviors which, of course, is more likely that the enemy is going to be moving in those directions. So I'm not speaking anything against material goods because I've seen how the Lord is able to bless his people. Amen? And when in the Garden of Eden, if it's a, called delightful living, voluptuous living, God's not opposed to those things, but what God is opposed to is our priorities. And he always wants us to understand there's more going on than meets the eyes. That's why in these scriptures we really find out it is about a spiritual conflict, isn't it? Eve was standing there next to the tree and didn't realize she was in the middle of a spiritual conflict because after all, this is about a tree. This is about food. This is about what appeals to me. This is what's going to give me a sense of satisfaction. It's all about these things. And Oh, well, I, I learned about the Lord on Sunday. I'm, my spiritual life is in order. But what does this have to do with it? Well, it's when these things begin to draw us out of the perspective that God wants us to have. This is why this scripture is very important, where it says, even when we were dead in trespass and sin, our former conduct, God made us alive together with who? Why? Because by grace you have been saved. How many out there are glad for grace? Amen? Now, after he saved us by grace, what did he do? He raised us up. He raised us up. I want to emphasize that word. He raises up together and made us, notice it's not saying made me, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. When the Bible talks about grace, what is grace? Well, if you were dead in your sins, how many know a dead person can help theirself? So... It was God's grace that said, I'm going to bring you from the dead. Well, this is grace's ongoing work in our life. Grace's ongoing work in our life is what we can't do, God can do. And this is important to understand because as a Christian, I can live an overcoming, victorious life. I believe with everything within me that the world is looking for the manifestation of the sons of God in the earth. I believe the world is looking for an example that they can follow. I believe just like the Bible says, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. I believe in the latter days of time, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains exalted above the hills. How is that possible? Well, because of God's grace. But again, we have to understand that we're seated together in Christ Jesus. Amen? And this is so important for us to understand because there's a place you cannot go in God when you're by yourself. As an evangelical Protestant, we talk a lot about how important it is for us to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's absolutely true. It must start personal. But as even Ashley was mentioning what God was speaking to her today, it's so important that we realize that in our Christianity, we can't be motivated by earthly thinking. It can't be about me alone. 
I have to realize that we are seated together with somebody. And so we have to walk in the fullness of all things that God has for us. Can you say amen to that? And how are we going to do that, church? Together. I'll ask it again so you can get it. How are we going to do that? Yes. When we're seated together in heavenly places, that's when we're going to walk in the fullness of that exceeding glory that God wants to bring us to. And that's why it talks about the exceeding riches, because I believe it's time for us to move into the exceeded riches. I believe he wants to do that which is exceedingly above, which we could think or act. And just like I said in the, the opening, I believe that we need to know about the exceeding greatness of his power that raised Christ from the dead. I believe we're moving into one of the most supernatural times the body of Christ has ever seen. Hallelujah. But it's going to happen when we begin to understand where God wants us seated. Now, with that in mind, we go to Acts chapter 2. It says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day 3,000 souls were added to them. They continued steadfastly. I mean, that's what we need to do. How did they continue steadfastly? Well, they did it in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, in prayers, and then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. I'm looking for signs and wonders like we've never seen before. Amen. I mentioned this scripture when I was talking about culture a few months back because it's important for us to understand that we're living in a perverse generation. The very first sermon that's preached, he didn't tell them how to get saved from hell. He told them how to get saved from the perverse generation that just crucified Jesus Christ. And we're living in a perverse generation today that seeks to crucify him afresh, seeks to crucify his people, seeks to crucify everything that we believe to know in the word of God is true. Amen, church? And so we have to understand that we got to be saved from this perverse generation. And it comes when we realize spiritually we've been seated together with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. And with that, having the proper perspective, but understand it can only come when we're walking in the fullness of all the things that God has for us. And so with that, we have to realize there are spiritual things, which I talked about last week, which is involving baptism, the Lord's Supper, coming to church, worship and praise, studying the Word of God, all the things that we do on a regular basis here in church. But I also want to point out from that scripture what I'll call a practical side to what was being told them. And uh, even though it's more than practical, it's very spiritual, it would have seemed to be the least spiritual thing that they were engaged in when they continued steadfastly, and that is because they were in fellowship. Now, the word fellowship literally means to be in partnership. It means literally participation or also social interaction with somebody else. So. When we think about the word fellowship in the original context of the word in the Greek language, it can speak about partnership. It certainly speaks about participation and ultimately social interaction. And, and so it's important for us to recognize this. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover is the social interaction because growing up in church, whenever you got together with people, you said, oh, we're going to have a fellowship. Let's get together for a fellowship. And, and that's a part of it. But we have to understand it's much more than that. And the first thing we want to talk about is how that it's about a partnership. Now, look what the Bible says here in the book of Genesis chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill up the earth, subdue it. Have dominion. Wow over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. I want to point out the word partnership because do you realize in the very beginning God wanted us to be his partners? In Galatians chapter 4, the apostle Paul is writing to the church of Galatia because they're caught in the argument about the law of Moses versus the new covenant and the law of the spirit. And he said, well, you have to understand something. You used to be God's slaves because the Bible says that 
Well, even though you have an inheritance, when you're just a child, you're treated no different than a slave or a servant, if you would, because you have to be trained and tutored until the time you can be treated as a son. How many know we have to understand that God didn't want us to be slaves? He wants us to be sons. And that his beginning plan is, I'm going to create man in my image and also in my likeness. And they're going to be fruitful, and they're going to have this place whereby I will give them dominion, says the mighty God. There's, there's an exercise of dominion God wants to bring us to in this day that we have not, again, reached out and had. But I believe it's coming in a dimension like we've never known before. And I believe God's been preparing us as a local church for it. I believe that God's been preparing you as a person that's hearing this message today that you'd be ready for the next phase that God has for you because God says it's time for the dominion. It's time to subdue. It's time for overcoming, says the mighty God. Get excited about that and give the Lord a praise, church. It's so important. And not only did God say, I want you to be my partner but I want you to be partners with each other. If you notice in the scripture, it says when God created man in the beginning, he created them in his image, male and female. So Genesis chapter 1 is a general view of the creation, but in chapter 2, we kind of focus in and it retells the story about the creation of man so that God could show the difference between male and female and what was his perspective and being involved in that. So when he created Adam, what did he say to him? He said, it's not good that man should be alone. Ephesians 5 says that's really a picture of not just man and woman getting married, but it's the picture of Christ in the church. God said, I don't want any of you to be alone. That the stewardship I have for you, the responsibility I have for you, is going to require you to have a partnership, says the Lord. I'm so grateful for the many partners I've had in my life, starting with my family, Mama Jean and Papa Bill and my brothers and sisters who always were very helpful to me in life. And I'm like, wow, thank you, Lord, for such a great family. In the auditorium or in the lobby back there, we have our mothers in Israel because I'm so grateful because there was a core group of ladies, especially in the beginning, who just did everything they could for the ministry. And wow, when you have people working with the church, it multiplies your capacity. Amen. And I believe that God says to the body of Christ, we have to understand how important it is that God has created us, not just to have a personal relationship with him, but to learn what it is to have partners in your life who can help you fulfill your destiny. And like I said, I don't believe we as Christians can live victoriously in this world with all the influences of the devil and all the influence of the God of this world and all the influence of marketing and elites and special interest group trying to pull you in. When God says, I want you to know you're the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath, says the mighty God. And it's time for you to go in and take possession of the promised land, says the mighty God. I don't want you seeing yourself down here, but I want you to understand that by partnering together, you can see the fulfillment of all things that I have spoken, says the Lord. When it comes to participation, this scripture is so powerful. It says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Those are the elites and the agendas I'm talking to you about. But what? Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Fellowship being participation means that you're part of a people that you've been called to worship with who are also your accountability partners. It says, and speaking the truth in love. See, when you believe in fellowship, you have people in your life who can speak into your life. Can I hear more than one amen on that? How many know we, we, we need sometimes other perspectives where people say, well, do you know what's going on here? I didn't think of that. Rather than say, oh, what do you know? How many know we, we need to have a 
open heart, open mind, open spirit to one another. Amen? It's so important. And speaking of the truth, in love means sometimes you got to say things to people that they don't want to hear, but it's best in their interest to not only to hear it, but to allow themselves to partake of it. And that can be the beauty of a marriage relationship. It can be the beauty of a personal relationship. You know, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so does a man, the countenance of his friend. That's only true if you have a true friend who's willing to look at you and say, you know what, I'm afraid you're going to miss out on God or you're going to miss out in life unless you allow yourself to see such and such. Amen, church? So it's about accountability. And uh, this is very important because it says, we're going to build up ourselves in love as each person recognizes they have a part. And when every part is doing their part, the body will build itself up in love. See, there's a certain level we can't go until every part is functioning as it should because we are the what? Body of Christ and members in particular. God has given us a message of Christian maturity. And of course, I've been teaching that message of Christian maturity since we started the church. And we believe very much in teaching here. Mama Jean had this word when she first started her class, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But maturity isn't something you can get by learning what it is about. How do you know maturity comes as you live out life? Put to practice what you've learned, deal with your failures, and enjoy your successes. But all the while having a learning experience as you're walking in this thing to experience the full blessing that God has for you. And in closing, I want to talk about social connections because the Bible says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from what? House to house. So they had their temple part and they had their house to house part. Amen. Now, we don't always eat at home now, so that could say, and breaking bread from coffee house to coffee house, breaking bread from restaurant to restaurant. My dad used to tell the story that somebody called Mama Jean for prayer. It was about the dinner time, so they said, I hope we're not interfering with your dinner. He said, you'd have to call the big boy to interrupt for our dinner because my wife don't cook anymore. Anyway, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, and this is what I believe is going to happen as never before, and having favor with all the people. And when that happens, the Lord added to the church daily those who should be saved.